What's up guys? I'm Adrian TC and welcome to another episode of the SFI podcast. In this episode, we'll be taking a look at SFI's cool new game called Panzer Killer. We'll also be talking to the game designer, games and comics veteran Pepe Moreno. So check it out. Four! Hi, my name is Pepe Moreno and I'm the designer of Pouncer Killer. I want to tell you about the game. Um, it's a beautiful game. The texture maps in the game are all photographs from Normandy that I took a few summers ago. Um, the game is designed as an arcade game basically, so you really don't get bored, but it has a lot of latitude, meaning if you're a better tanker, you'll do better in the game. There are levels, for instance, which are very difficult to pass, but if you actually are more knowledgeable about how tank warfare works, you actually would pass them in a very easy way. It has a lot to do with, you know, a cautious tanker is a tanker to survive. You know, if you're too impetuous and too aggressive, you might not really last to tell the story. Pepe Moreno began his career as a comic book writer and artist and first established himself with the creation of his graphic novel, Batman, Digital Justice. Shortly thereafter, Pepe went on to create a variety of video game titles, namely Hell Cab, Beachhead 2000, and Target Hunt, the prequel to Panzer Killer. In World War II, actually, uh the casualty rates for tankers was 95% and up. Percentage they improved very slightly, you know, as experience came into the picture. So like you, you have to pay attention to what you do. And that is actually the secret. The proper measure of aggressivity and caution will actually get you far into the game. And who knows? You might need to tell the story. Game 7, 71 million viewers, you have all their emotions in your left hand. That's what someone said. You're right. I didn't have their emotions in any no. hand. You know, I, I, they had to watch and I performed brilliantly up until about the sixth inning and I was done for after we did not turn the double play. Right. On, as soon as we did not turn the double play on bench and I had two outs and I was storming around the mound, I was emotional, I was mad. Right. It's the obligation of the manager or the pitching coach to come out and talk to me then. Right. Not after I hang the curveball to Tony Perez and he hits a two-run homer. Get me out of the game, settle me down, explain to me the situation. Right. Listen, Tony Perez is out there, we can't walk him. I don't want you to pitch around him because then you've got a, a foster coming up and you're out of the ball game. If we don't give up those three runs or two runs in the sixth inning, you know, we may have won that ball game. But if we had won game two. So it's a lot of hindsight. If we had won game two, which we had the potential of winning, we had a two to one lead in the top of the ninth inning. If we had won game two, when Fisk hit the home run at 12.43 in the morning on game six, that would have been the clincher for the world championship and the town bells in Boston would still be ringing today. <laughs> As a baseball traditionalist, isn't it unusual since the game of baseball is a product of evolution where it evolved from a previous sport? Rounders. Rounders. 
So cricket, everybody, you know. Some would argue that the DH is just another step in the evolution process. No, no, it's not because it's 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 it was brought off for the first point by the American League to lessen to uh, lessen salaries to lessen two spots on a run. You needed two less players. You didn't need another pitcher, and you didn't need another pitch hitter or utility person. So basically, they thought they could take three jobs off of a roster, thereby not paying 25 men but paying 22 men. That was the number one intent of Charles Finley. And that was what him and Bowie Kuhn did. And uh, we filed a protest, and then uh, we were exonerated in a federal court. That, that was. It was, uh, it was restraint to work, basically. Boston Red Sox won the World Series finally, but they entered it as a wild card team. Does that taint the championship? That's a good question. The last four have been wild card teams that have won the World Championships. You know, the Florida Marlins were World Champions. The, uh, the, the team out of uh, Arizona. Right. I was against it originally, but I find out that it is better that uh, it gives more teams opportunity or hope at the beginning of the season to make the playoffs. So, you know, it's, it, is, uh, it is an evolutionary thing, and uh, the Red Sox should have won it in 75, you know, right. when they were division champs instead of... Uh, they start the picture. Yeah, that's too bad. And then we could have won it in 78, we could have won it in 79, 80, and 81. I could have been on a world champion four years in a row. Except for stupid manager. <laughs> All right, let's talk about your barnstorming around the world. Yeah, I, I barnstorm. I've played across Canada. I've hit a home run in every province. I've thrown a complete game in every province. And not one Canadian out there can say he's done that. And yet, am I in the Canadian Hall of Fame in St. Mary's? No. Am I in the Red Sox Hall of Fame, being the second winningest left-hander in Red Sox history? No. Am I in the USC Hall of Fame for being the winningest left-hander in USC history and one of the winningest pitchers in USC history? No. Why? Because I am an agitator. <laughs> and as H. Rap Brown said, you can't get the wash clean unless you agitate it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Your breath. What's on the phone?